everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today I'm going to be analyzing this very fascinating case of the murder of Garrett Phillips, who was just 12 years old at the time. And the <clears throat> this guy, his name is Nick Hillary. He was the one that was tried and not convicted for the murder. He was found not guilty. And so the case goes on as unsolved. And there's been a documentary that came out, which is very popular on HBO. I'll be discussing that. And there's also another doc on uh, 2020, which is on YouTube. And I'm going to link both below. So we're going to get into this. And before I want to say hello to everybody in the chat room. <clears throat> okay, people say they can see and hear me. Did you all hear the intro? That's what I want to know. Somebody tell me if you actually heard the intro this time. Because the last time I did this, uh, nobody could hear the intro. And so then I had to take take it down and edit it and put the intro music back in. You heard the intro this time. Okay, great. Uh, StreamYard, which is the, the platform I work on, said that they had some weird problem where you put up a video and you couldn't hear the audio part of it. And so they said they were fixing it and maybe they actually fixed it. Oh, right. That's fantastic. So <laughs> now wait a minute. You Now you say there's no intro, no intro in Denmark. Okay. Maybe they didn't fix it. What the heck? So some heard the intro and some didn't hear the intro. This is so bizarre. Okay. never mind. What? Half the people heard it and half didn't. I'm going to have to tell StreamYard that. That's really weird. But if you're coming to this, um, if you're not here in the chat room now, uh, which means you're not a member of Patreon, uh, it's a patron-only chat room. If you're coming here later, the public, and you say, but Pat, I hear the intro, it's because I'm going to have to edit this video and my son will fix it and put the, the audio into the video. And so you're going to hear it normally and you're going... Because a lot of people wrote me last time, I can hear it, I can hear it. I'm like, no, 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 we fixed it. That's why you can hear it. Interesting. Anyway, that is that is so strange. Okay. Uh, anyway, hmm, just trying to figure out the uh, technical problems. And this time, folks, it's not my problem. It's StreamYard's problem. I didn't do it. So <laughs> a lot of times people laugh because... Sometimes I do have technical problems and it is me. I'm trying to figure out lights and some something goes wrong. But this time, not me. It's the system and they're trying to fix it. But I guess they haven't accomplished it. So anyway, if you'd like to be in the chat room, please do join Patreon. The link is below. You can come to all the live chats, um, uh, the hangouts every week and also the live cases every week. Or please just join just subscribe, not join, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That does support the channel as well. Share, like, all that. And uh, you can always buy one of my books or click the money button below, that little dollar sign, and support the channel with a one-time donation as this is an educational channel. And I don't bleed things for just for the money. <laughs> but I do appreciate your support. Okay, now back to what we really want to talk about here. All right, so now I'm hot already as usual. All right, so I want to welcome Marion here, Kelly, Lila, Stephanie, Scarlett. Let's see, lots is here. Christine is here. You heard the intro in Minnesota. What the heck? This is so weird. <laughs> Carrie's here. Ms. Lee is here. Allison is here. Uh, Benny is here from Denmark, and no intro in Denmark, see? Uh, Ms. Cherboni Colan. Jello. I think I tried to say that correctly last time. T Coon is here as well. Leslie's here. Who do do do? Who did I miss? Did I miss somebody? Scarlett's here. Mm -mm -mm. Steph, I, I'm going to start repeating myself, which is what I always do. Annie Haley is here. Okay, lots of folks are here, and if I missed your name, I'm really sorry. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you're here for this case, which to me, I have some personal feelings about. Okay, and I'm going to explain them to you. But let me start with where did I get my info from? All right. Uh, along with the, lots of stuff on the internet, I did watch two documentaries. Uh, the, these are the two. There's this one, Who Killed Garrett Phillips? And this one is um, uh, from HBO. It's a two-part series, so you do have to have HBO to see it. Uh, and this, let me see, where's the other one? Where did my other one go? Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm suffering with the other one disappearing problem. I can't believe it. Where did it go? Hold on a second, folks. Oh, here it is. There we go. Uh, Dateline. Uh, this is the Dateline show from 2020. Uh, ignore the fact that the person who put this up can't spell secret. 
Um, I'm not even sure what the name of the show is because of what he wrote up here. But anyway, you do get to see it for free on YouTube. And it's a 40 minute show. And that's the other one. Now, let me talk first about the HBO one, uh, because I have a, it's, it's, it's just quite fascinating. This is the woman who is the one behind that show. And um, I liked her previous uh, uh, sh uh, video, which her documentary, which was uh, Something's Wrong with Aunt Diane. I think that's fabulous. And I did a show on that based on her documentary. And I think it's really good. This one now is the is the the new one she has done and it's called who killed garrett phillips and i'm going to read you from the daily mail uh just to give you an idea of the story and then i'm going to talk a little bit about the, the documentary and then i'm going to get into the whole crime who killed garrett phillips a new documentary looks at the murder of a 12 year old boy that devastated a family shook a northern new york town and destroyed the man who was not found guilty of the crime as the case remains unsolved eight years later. Now, the basics of the crime are this. On October 24th, 2011, and this is kind of really important. I want you to keep the, the year 2011 in your mind, and I'll explain why later. In 2011, 12-year-old Garrett Phillips was murdered in Potsdam, New York. Now, Potsdam, New York is right near the Canadian border. And as it says here, uh, Potsdam is 88% white, and about 4% black. I'm not sure what the other 8% is, um, according to the U.S. Census Bureau data. Okay. And the population is around 15,000. All right. Uh, and this becomes a very important part of this whole story because it is considered a majority white town with very few black residents. And here was this man there and he was in a relationship with this woman who is the mother of this child. And this becomes a big issue. Did race essentially, uh, who's going to use the word color, but they do, that's, uh, <laughs> color this whole thing. Yeah, okay, <laughs> color this whole thing. Is, is Was race an issue in this town? And was race an issue in this case? And this is what I want to discuss, along with who I thought, who I think did it, what I think the evidence shows. All right, so the police, after he was, after he was murdered, strangled in his parent, his mother's apartment, his family home is an apartment, uh, let me just show you a picture of the, the place. Um, hold on a second. Where did my picture go? It's going to be one of these days. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, where's my picture? You have to you have to bop around a few different places on, on, on this stuff. So where in the world did it go? Oh, here it is. <laughs> okay. This is the place he lived. He lived on the second floor. Okay. Uh, this is a, a picture from now, and this is important too because you don't see many trees around. But at the time, there were more trees, and this can this can have some effect on how this crime was committed and why no one actually saw the guy who did the crime, in spite of the fact it was daytime. All right. So anyway, he was. Um, let me go back to my original picture here. Um, all right. Now, all right. So this little boy was killed in 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 the in the apartment. He was strangled to death asphyxiated and strangled. All right. Now they immediately, the police immediately focused on this guy by the name of Nick Hillary. Um, he was, uh, because uh, he was the girl, he's the boyfriend of, of the mother, right? Or, well, that's not true. The ex-boyfriend of the mother. And you know how that always goes. It's an ex. So, you know, that puts you in a bad position. They focused right away on him. At the time of the murder, he was the, a soccer coach for Clarkson University. All right. Then nearly five years later, he, uh, always, he always maintained his innocence. He was tried for the crime and found not guilty. He lost his job, and the day of the verdict said, everything I have built until this point has been totally destroyed. And then this documentary is, is about this. All right. Now, let me just tell you one thing about the documentary. All right. Which I find fascinating, the way they, they, they this is from the Washington Post. Who Killed Garrett, Garrett Phillips is a masterful study in the evils of assumptions. And the, the assumptions, I'm guessing, according to the Washington Post, are that a black man would commit this crime and not a white man. I'm guessing that's what it is. Assumptions. I don't think it was just that he was an ex-boyfriend. 
because she has another ex-boyfriend uh, who was a white police officer. And some people go, hey, what about the other ex-boyfriend? The one before this one, you know, could it have been him? He was a jealous dude too. A masterful study in the evils of assumptions. Well, what I find really fascinating about this HBO documentary is that it's full of assumptions. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about those assumptions because I have some inside knowledge from my own family history that I can knock down a lot of these assumptions people are making, which drive me nuts in this, in this uh, documentary. Uh, I don't mind if you're looking at the evidence and then you come to a conclusion, uh, but they're throwing out a lot of assumptions in the documentary, which I find rather bizarre. So at the end of, uh, at the end of this uh, story from the Washington Post, it says this, um, it says, this allows who killed Garrett Phillips to concentrate on the real takeaway, absent any evidence. Now, first of all, that's, that's not true right away. There is evidence, highly circumstantial, mind you, but there's evidence. So, you know, we have to look at the evidence. You can't just say there isn't any, there is. And even if you find a person not guilty because you don't think there's enough evidence and the evidence isn't, isn't really, really pointing out that it's him and not somebody else, fine. But don't say there's none, because there is. One of the pieces of evidence is he's strangled. That's evidence. <laughs> he was strangled in his apartment. That's evidence. There's evidence. <laughs> All right. Um, absent any evidence, a boy is still dead, and an innocent man's livelihood was all but ruined. All right. Um, he was found not guilty. That doesn't necessarily mean he's innocent. He's just found not guilty. So the entire take of this particular documentary is that he's an innocent man, that he, it was a racial incident uh, based, you know, the whole thing was racial. Uh, there was zero evidence to look at him at all. And therefore this was a travesty. All right, it says, it takes certain moral courage. Oh, wait a minute, a man, boy is still dead and an innocent man's livelihood was all but ruined by zealous authorities. Well, maybe they were zealous. I'm not saying they didn't do some wrong things. Maybe the police didn't do some things as proper as they should or the prosecution. They were truly zealous, but does that mean they had the wrong person or does that mean they just didn't do a very good job on what they did? And I'm not, I, at this point, I'm not going to say because I'm going to take you through the evidence. Um, it takes a certain amount of certain moral courage these days to make a crime documentary that sticks to the facts. No, they left so many facts out of this documentary, it drove me nuts. Um, rather than detonate a, a fresh series of a series of theories or otherwise. That is true. They didn't really point out who else could have done it. Um, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Think about this for a second. I'm just, just pointing this out. There's a problem. And I'm going to point out the possible suspects in a little bit, and you'll see why maybe they didn't go there. All right. In other words, the film leaves the question in the title unanswered, as Garbus gives her sources an opportunity to speak or not, about the choices they made. No, this is documentary. They have agendas. Agen People who make documentaries pick what they want in the documentary and pick what they don't want in the documentary, which is why I often don't do documentaries anymore because they edit the crap out of me or just don't, don't allow me to speak at all. All right. Um, so ambiguity is not a flaw here. No, it isn't ambiguous. We know what the, 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 the point of this documentary is to prove racism is involved in the in the um, the arrest and the trial of of, of Nick Hillary, uh, and that so they're they're, they're saying it's not ambiguous uh, that he maybe could have done it. They're just saying he absolutely didn't do it, and he it was a whole racist thing. Uh, so what makes the story so compelling and infuriating and sad? Well, that's what they intended you to feel, so that's what you feel. Now, there's another documentary. Let me that, let me talk about the other documentary. All right, this is Dateline. Sorry, I'm itching my nose behind the screen here. <laughs> my nose is driving me crazy. Uh, Dateline 20, whatever, Secret. <laughs> I don't know what the name of it is. Anyway, uh, this is a 2021. This is a very good documentary. It's very even-handed. Uh, sometimes I don't go with, sometimes I'm pissed off at 2020, but this one, I like. Just like I, I liked what uh, Something's Wrong with Aunt Diane. Garbus did a great job in that one. Don't love this one she did. 2020 sometimes pisses me off. This one they didn't. They're very even-handed. They got in a lot of information. Uh, and I think it leaves you with 
then considering what do you think? So if you're gonna watch a, uh, a documentary that's focused on evidence and facts, and then let you make your own decisions at that point, watch the 2021, I think it's much, much better. So, all right, so now let's get to the, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> But she knows. It she knows. I won't check your comments before I go on. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, hi, Laura. You say I've been so torn. I'm leaning one way. Been very curious what you think. I have a feeling you'll be agreeing with me. Interesting. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure whether I will or will not. Lisa says I don't know this case and I don't have a theory. <laughs> well, hopefully by the end you might um, have a theory. Um, uh, is it a heartbreaking case? Yes, it is because, you know, a 12 year old boy was murdered and nobody has been convicted of it. And the family certainly is devastated. And if he's innocent, he was found not guilty. It did screw up his life. That's for sure. All right. So now let's see what else you might have to say. Um, okay. Now I'm going to discuss this in a bit. Kelly says, if they just went for the soccer coach and then became blinded to other scenarios, that's a problem. That is true. You have to be very careful whenever you're working a case not to get tunnel vision. But on the other hand, you have to understand that sometimes you cannot help looking a certain way first. And so you can't necessarily say the police are wrong in doing that. Uh, let's say, for example, a woman, you hear a woman screaming. You see a man run out of her house with a bloody knife running down the block and you stop him. You're going to look at him first. <laughs> you know. Now, it could be that he was actually, um, he could have been uh, a friend of hers who was there when somebody attacked both of them and he might've been trying to protect her and he stabbed the guy one time, got blood on his knife and he ran. You see, could be innocent. So, but there's no, or there's a reason the police are gonna look at somebody. So we can't say that's a problem. What we can say is if they're not looking at the evidence and they're not looking elsewhere, if the evidence points them elsewhere, then we have a problem. Uh, uh, Stephanie says most documentaries sh should be viewed as an argument being made rather than impartial downloading of facts. That is usually very true. And unfortunately, these days it gets more and more true that we have so many agendas behind things that even if even if they're telling like, for example, in the HBO one, even if this guy's innocent, the agenda behind it was about racism. It wasn't about his innocence. And that bugs me because the question is, are they focused on the right thing? And they're claiming that the whole reason he was even looked at was because he was black in a town that was mostly white. Well, let me get to that. All right. Let me first just tell you the basics of the actual crime. So what happened was this, this young boy, he was last seen outside of his school. Um, and he, by the way, it's just, I just want to point out it was a crappy rainy day in where was this? I forgot the name of the town. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. Let me find the name of the town. Uh, Potts what? <laughs> Sorry. I can't remember the name of the town. Uh, let me go back to the information I need here. All right. Um, po Potsdam. Potsdam. Or Potsdam. I don't know how you pronounce it. Anyway, it was a rainy, crappy day in Potsdam. And it was October 24th in on the border of Canada, which means it was kind of like Maryland. Cold, rainy, crappy. Okay. And this is important. Cold, rainy, and crappy means something in this case. All right. So this young boy was last seen. Um, here he is on his, what they call a, what do they call this thing? Okay. It's called a ripstick. I am having trouble with this word. It's a skateboard like contraption that twists. And he was seen tooling around Potsdam, a town in northern New York, on the day of his death on October 24th, 2011. That's him. It's outside of his school. He's about to go home, okay, on that skateboard, uh, which they call a ripstick, which I've never even heard that term. So there you go. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm old. I'm just going to say I don't really have a thing for skateboards because they scare the crap out of me, and I'm not going to stand on one. <laughs> so anyway, so he's out there. And he's on, going home. Now, it's not very long when he gets home. Let me find information on this. All right. So, hold on a second. All right. So, at about 8 minutes to 5 p.m., so 4.52, 
On October 24th, 2011, Garrett was seen rip sticking at the town's high school. It's security video show. Luckily, they did have some videos, not enough in this town for my, for my happiness, but they had some at the school and at the hospital. But 2011, I guess, I don't know, it's only 10, 10, wait a minute, 12 years ago. They should have had more people's with ring cameras and stuff, but it didn't appear to be so. Anyway, he was seen on the security camera. And, and it took him about six minutes to make his way home to the building where he, his brother, and his mother lived. Now, uh, I don't, when they say six minutes, I'm not sure that means that he walked the six minutes or he rolled the six minutes. There, There's a problem there. And some people say he walked home. But did he, if he had the ripstick thing or would he just ride most of the way home? Which could mean his six minutes could be three minutes. We don't, we, these are the things we don't absolutely know. All right. Meanwhile, his neighbors, a couple, Marissa Vogel and Sean Hall, were eating dinner at around 5 p.m. when they heard a running, heard running, a crash, and what sounded like a moan for help. Okay. So there, uh, I want to point out where this building is as well. This building that I showed you that picture previously, um, it's, it's in a little apartment building, and it has, it's an old building, and it's got, I don't know how many apartments in it, it looked like about maybe four to me. Um, and, and these people that they were college students, which is important again, because this is, this is a location where somebody may be home during the day. Okay. It wasn't not a big location. It's not like a massive apartment building, but somebody may be a home during the day. And then there were some other out, uh, apartments around there that theoretically they could have seen out their windows or be driving around and see who did this. All right. She hears something. She hears a screaming and like, no. All right. She gets freaked out by that. And she said she thought she could hear the word help. And I will never forget that word. Je that person, the, the person sounded scared, but it sounded like a child to her. Concerned, she went, she went up the stairs because they're on the next floor. Uh, there, so they went up the stairs. Uh, and she knocked on the door. And then she heard a click. This is the lock. Somebody apparently locked the door at that point. After she knocked, they went, which I think is interesting again. Because that shows a person who has control of their emotions and their thinking at that point in time. And this will be important when you consider who the suspects could be. Somebody made sure that door was locked. Now, that was, then she freaked out. So she then called the police and she did that at 5.08 p.m. All right. About six minutes later, an officer was at the apartment. He knocked on the door and he thought he saw thought he heard. And this is again, very important. So six minutes later, he arrives about 514. He thinks he hears someone walking around. The problem is here thinks, uh, you know, when you have people who think they heard something, you're never sure they heard something. That's the problem. Uh, and you don't know what they heard and from what angle they heard it from. This is an apartment building. You can hear things from apartments next door. You can hear things that come through the floors. You could think it was walking around when it was just thumping. Somebody moved. Um, but we don't know. We don't even know if he actually heard anything from the apartment. This is really super, super important. He heard something for a second. And then he didn't probably know exactly what he heard. This is being used uh, by both the prosecution and the defense uh, as to, hey, did he hear something or didn't he hear something? And I'll, I'll explain that again later, a little later. So he heard this, so he thought he heard a sound. He tried again to knock on the door while the police dispatcher called the landlord. So he'd bring the key to the apartment. After the landlord arrived a little after 5.30, so now we're talking about another 15 minutes, uh, he opened the door. The officer found Garrett, who was taken to the hospital. Uh, and he was pronounced dead at 7.18 due to strangulation and suffocation. He was alive when they went in. Not very alive, but alive enough that the question then comes down to, was he unable to move by the time that sound was heard? Or could he have the sound have been heard? Could it have been Garrett moving himself in the last throes of whatever? Again, we don't know. Now, let's take a look at the apartment. Um, yeah, here it is. Inside this apartment, it's not a very good picture, but Garrett was found in his mother's bedroom. Oh, let me let me show you a couple other things here. Um, okay, when the the police came in, they saw that he had. Remember that ripstick thing? 
he had set the ripstick thing up against the wall. So he wasn't assaulted coming in the door. Okay. There's this, the time frame in here is really tiny, tiny, tiny. He gets home and gets killed, essentially gets home and gets killed. Here's his ripstick. Weird sound. Sorry, just got distracted by a really weird sound. Okay. Um, there's his ripstick. And then he also had put down his, uh, his, his book bag. And that was all that was really out of place in the apartment. Okay. So then somebody got him. Whether now we don't know whether the person was waiting in the apartment, someone had already gotten there and was waiting inside, or whether someone followed him in, or whether someone knocked on the door and was let in, or whether someone used a key to get it. We just don't know any of this. This is this is what the kind of evidence we don't know. What we do know is he's found in his mother's bedroom, dead, or dying, dying essentially. Now, what the other thing they found was this window, which is not in that bedroom, just next next to the bedroom, and I think it was a hall or another location. Anyway, the somebody had knocked the screen out, as you see here, and gone through that window and jumped out the window to get away. So we know that the person did not open the front door and run down the hall. So what happened was, the question is, when does this person jump out the window? And this will always remain a, a, one of those things that we don't know. There's a, that woman, the neighbor, she knocks on the door and she hears the guy lock the door. Now, the question is, is that when he jumped out the bloody window? Because personally for me, I'd be jumping quick because she's out in the hallway and I want to get out of there. I might jump out the window. Or did he hear her walk away and he could have run then. He could have just opened the door and just throwing something over. I don't know if he's wearing a hoodie or not, but that's just a lot of people do. Doesn't matter what race you are. I mean, I have hoodies too, that you just cover your head and then run because you don't, you know, the woman's not there and you want to get out of there. But that isn't what happened. The person did not go down the stairs. So did the person not jump out the window when the woman left? Did he wait? I don't know, doing something else because the kid was obviously probably already dying. Um, what else was he doing there? I don't know. Police arrive, knock on the door. They hear something supposedly. Was that when he then jumped out the window? Waited till the police arrive, which seems kind of like a long time to wait. I'd get out of there quicker. So again, when the police say they heard something, I'm not sure they heard the guy in the apartment because if I were him, I would have gotten that quick. Okay, so, but that's what happened. The guy did jump out the window. Okay, so this is going to be important in the long run of this, this particular story. Now, the question comes down to, why would anybody, why would anybody kill a kid? And in that short period of time, and that's, that, that became a big issue. So let's look at, let's look at some possibilities here. They, they honed in on uh, Nick Hillary because it was the ex-boyfriend. Okay. And they'd broken up fairly recently. They, they um, and the claim was that the reason the mom moved out, they had gotten a place together. Oh, let me, let me go back and show you who they are. All right, so let, let, let me show you Nick Hillary and 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 uh, where's my picture? Okay, here we go. And Nick Hillary, <clears throat> this is uh, this is him and his not his wife, his girlfriend. They had three children together at the time. He hooked up with the mom. She had these kids, I think were, I'm, I'm going to blank here, uh, from a couple of marriages. Um, and one, the, his father died. I think this one didn't work out. And she had also hooked up with the, 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 the police officer. Let me show you a picture of him again. Uh, this guy, John, I think his name is John Jones. Um, and then they, they, they were, I think, sort of together at the time that <laughs> these two hooked up. She was bartending. He was, they said he was drinking his Guinness, which is a Jamaican thing to do and hit it off. And then they got together. All right. So they did get together. Um, he kind of dumped his girlfriend and she dumped whomever she was with. And then they, they had this relationship and they seemed like pretty happy people together. And then they moved in together and they were together like a year, but apparently uh, his, she, she said his children, her children couldn't get along with him because he was very much of a disciplinarian and, and said no TV during the week. You got to do this. You got to do that. And they didn't like him, especially Garrett. And then she broke up with him and moved into her own place because of that. 
And, and he actually claims that that is not a reason that they broke up. But if you look at this, this is, this is actually a text from her. I've been waiting for almost a year for the feeling and situation between you and my kids to get better. And it's not, this is not easy for me either, but I have to put my kids first. Yes. It's about the boys. Okay. Mom stepped up to the plate. She said, Hey, you know, this guy's in my life, which he shouldn't have been in her apartment. I, I, I'm, I'm totally against people with children jumping into relationships where they put the, the, the boyfriend and girlfriend together with the kids because it doesn't usually go well. And apparently Garrett did not like him because he was a more of a disciplinarian. She might've been more of a lenient parent. I'm not even going to say here right now who's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way it was. So she moved out and he became the ex and there was a, there was this thing where, you know, he had a key to her apartment and one day he like showed up at midnight in her apartment, creeped her out. So she said, give me back the key, which he did, but doesn't mean he doesn't have a second one. It doesn't mean he's going to knock down a door. We don't actually know, but they were broken up and Garrett didn't like him. He claims later that they had no, he had no problem with the kids. So he's, he has a problem with truth telling. Okay. So that's how that little relationship went. Now, the reason the police looked at him was because he was her ex-boyfriend and almost every police officer, at least a detective, when they're looking at somebody who's, does something happens, so they're going to look at recently what could, could have caused this. And they had broken up and he was the ex-boyfriend that her kid didn't like. The kid caused, caused the breakup. And was he angry at the kid? Uh, did he think he got rid of the kid? Mommy would run back to him and go, oh yeah, I lost my child. Who knows? But that's why they looked at him. Not because he was black in my opinion, but because he was ex-boyfriend. Now you say, because this goes all over the internet. Well, why didn't they look at her ex-ex-boyfriend? That police dude, you know? That police dude. This guy. Why didn't they look at him? I'll tell you why. Because he was seen at the time of the crime walking his dog on video. <laughs> there was a hospital camera that actually saw him walking his dog at the time the crime went down. So he couldn't, couldn't do it. I don't care if you don't like the dude. He didn't do it. Okay. So whether you think he's creepy or whatever you think, he's not the killer. So he's out. John Jones, or is that his name? Oh, I'm afraid I feel like I'm calling him the wrong name. I'm trying to find out what it actually is before I mess this up. Mm -mm. Could have though. Uh, I can't find his name. Darn it. That dude. Anyway, ex-boy, ex-ex-boyfriend. Um, he didn't do it. So now we have less uh, suspects. We have, we have Nick Hillary. Here's the next thing someone's, some people have said, well, it could have been uh, a choking game. You know, kids play these choking games, which is unfortunate. Uh, maybe another kid choked him and he healed that over and then he ran for it. Well, he had abrasions on his legs. He was brutally attacked. It doesn't look like any choking game to me. Plus, I just don't think that a kid his age would have the wherewithal to lock the door and jump out the window. I mean, I just don't think that's that's happening. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's just nonsense. Put that out. So now we have Nick Hillary or a burglar, somebody else in the apartment. That's what the suspect list is really small. Now, I want to get to the racism part of this because this, and then I'm going to go to the evidence, but I want to do the racism part first and then I'll go through the evidence and we'll see, does the evidence support that he should be the number one suspect or does the evidence really not go there at all in spite of everything? All right, let's take a look at the racial part of it. All right, uh, and this is a part I feel very confident in talking about, okay? Now, let me let me find I want to find the history of this guy. Um, hold on a second. Uh, I want to find one second. Uh, oh, John Jones was the name of the ex guy. Oh, he's a sheriff, sheriff's deputy. Yeah, I got his name right. Okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, Hillary. Okay, he immigrated to the United States from Can uh, from some, from Jamaica, sorry, Canada. <laughs> okay, there are Jamaicans in Canada who moved to the United States, but he. Okay, let me let me go back to um, him come him coming to the U.S. Okay, he is coming to the U.S. and he's coming as 
Is this it? No, that's not it. Hold on a sec. There he is. All right. Here he is. He's coming to the U.S. Immigrated here in. I'm not sure what date that is. Anyway, as a I guess as a kid. Okay. Um, and so he lived here for a while, and then he joined the the army. And he's a citizen now. He's joined the army. He's only in the army two and a half years, which that to me is interesting. He does have an honorable discharge, but my question is, why only two and a half years instead of four? And let me tell you something about honorable discharge. We always believe that somebody gets an honorable discharge. That means that they were just a great guy and the army said, see ya. Not so. Sometimes people get an honorable discharge when they should get a dishonorable discharge or at least just not honorable. When the, the when when the army just wants to get get rid of them and they don't want a big fight, they'll just give you the honorable discharge and kick you out. I had a serial killer suspect who got an honorable discharge, and he was working in, in armed security, armed security because he had an honorable discharge. And when I went back and talk, found out about went to talk to his dad about his honorable discharge, he goes, <laughs> the army like couldn't wait to get rid of them. They thought he was a total psychopath, and they were freaked out by him, and they wanted him out of there. So honorable discharge doesn't mean honorable discharge. Two and a half years, he could have a perfectly reasonable reason why he is out early or not. I don't know because none of the documentaries don't go into his, his history very well, which I find interesting. I, I don't see anything about his family. I don't see anything about his family supporting him. I'm like, where are these people? Where's his mom? Where's his dad? Where's his brothers or whatever sister? Whatever he's got. You don't hear anything about them in the documentaries. Where are they? I mean, so, suppose I saw some people in court that could have been relatives, but I just didn't see them speak up for him. And I, I think that's odd. But anyway, he comes out of the army and he, he gets a job. Um, he's a soccer coach for Clarkson University. All right. Now, let me say something about this is 2000, 2011 is when the boy died. So he was already dating the mom in 2010. And there's all this racism stuff going on. And I'm like, what are you doing? talking about what in the heck it's 2010 when he meets her at least 2010 we're not talking the 1950s here okay so i'm going to give you my personal history right here because i think i have a right to talk about it and i, I want to point out as i go to do this this is i've had these two charges before just because you were with a black man doesn't mean you're not a racist only the word with a black man was usually just because you're getting some black guys doesn't mean you're not a racist. That's usually the way it's, pre it's presented. Okay. Uh, and okay, it's true. You could be with a person of another race and still be racist. That's true. But just throwing that out there just for the sake of it. I've also been told because I do not have quote white children that that doesn't mean I'm not a racist. All right. Let me just say this as I go on. Two things. One, if you put that on my comments and my YouTube channel, you will be blocked immediately because I really don't care and I want you to go away. Uh, two, <laughs> if I fall into a Jamaican accent while I'm discussing things, uh, I do apologize if it's not correct um, uh, because I have I can do a really good Jamaican accent, but I've been away from it for a really long time. So now it'll be half-assed, and it's not to be insulting to Jamaicans. Uh, and so just have a sense of humor about it. Okay, that's my point there. Now let me go on to explain why I think I can understand what's going on here with Nick Hillary. Uh, first of all, okay, let me let me start here. All right, that's me. Ah, don't I look cute? Oh, so cute. Nineteen? No, no, no. Sorry, he's nineteen. I went for the young ones. Uh, he's that's that was my husband, uh, and my husband Tony, um, and that's not his original name, by the way. And I find it funny because uh, Hillary's name, his real name is Oral, and people are like Oral. What kind of name is that? And I'm thinking maybe some biblical thing because I like that in Jamaica. But then they called him Nick, which doesn't sound a bit like Oral. And this is very very true because in my my family. My husband's name was not Tony. It was completely different, not even close. Um, my, uh, let's see, how did this work? Um, his sister, her name was Mavis, but we called her Janet. Then there was Arlene, who we called Sally. And then there was Sesford, who we called Simon. And then there was, ah, the youngest one was actually called by a real name, but go figure. She was born, she was really young, so maybe American influence. And um, the funniest thing about his 
brother, young, the brother just under him was his name was, we called him Fred. And one day my sister-in-law said, oh, you know, I was in bed with Albert. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> That's when I found out his real name was Albert. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, the Jamaican thing. Whew. You know, so anyway, they get, they get a name and then their name something else completely different. Not like my name was Pat, you know, I was named Patricia. My parents called me Patty, which I hate and don't ever do that to me because it, Patty Duke show, rule me. And then people would say Patty to me all the time because of the Patty Duke show and I want to punch him in the face. And so anyway, um, so I met my my husband. Uh, he was 19 and he'd been in, in the U.S. for four years. He came when he was 15 years old um, and I was 20, 22, 23. So I was like three years older than him. And my first, I'm going to put this straight. My first boyfriend was from Korea because I did karate. I did Taekwondo and I met the, uh, the, the nephew of Jun Ri who opened the first Taekwondo uh, places in the United States. And I dated his nephew for a year. And we, uh, that was my first sort of love thing. And then he went to college and then everything just vanished. And then I dated this guy. I met in a record store. Um, he, was, he was a black guy, Af African-American. And um, he was hot. And he drove, a, he drove a convertible Corvette, which played like the eight track tapes in the day, <laughs> Parliament Funkadelic and all that Barry White. And, and he, wore, he wore a big, huge hat and some bell bottom pants and some platform shoes like this big. He looked like a pimp. He wasn't a pimp. He actually had a real job. Uh, <laughs> and then he drove into my neighborhood, which was McLean, Virginia, which is what, where everybody says we live one mile from the Kennedys. And it was a wealthy neighborhood. And there were my parents. Uh, my father's a GS-18 in the government with the Defense Department. My mother was a homemaker from New England. And here comes my boyfriend, you know, and I never intended to marry the guy because I always knew he wasn't marriage material, not because he was black, just because he was probably not the most honorable guy in the world, but he was hot. Anyway, <laughs> we were on and off for many years. And then I just said, okay, there's enough of this. So anyway, when I met in another record shop, I have a terrible background. <laughs> In another record shop because I was I had I just come back from Jamaica. I went to Jamaican record store and I met this guy. And then you know we we hooked up and then I, I told my mother I was bringing home this guy named Tony and she goes oh an Italian. <laughs> I'm like eh, not exactly. She was like darn it all. <laughs> and anyway I brought home the Jamaican. And then a year later I married the Jamaican. Did I have some warnings? It was. Now, this, is, this is what I really want to point out to you guys. Sorry. Hey, that was noisy. <laughs> no beer, just Diet Coke. Pepsi. I don't drink Diet Coke. Diet Pepsi. All right. When did I marry? 1979. Not 2000. I wasn't hooking up with a dude in 2010. Good God. By that time, my kids were in their 30s. <laughs> it's 1979. It was, it, this was in the beginning of where people did more interracial stuff. It wasn't 1950s. I wasn't scared to death or anything, but it was, it was still fairly unknown. Um, got looked at a lot. I do remember though, uh, I'll point this out. Uh, Nick Hillary was in sports. And let me tell you, sports changed things a little because even in my high school of 2000 students who were like mostly white, like almost everybody, uh, there were a couple football players who were black. And one of those football players had a white girlfriend and nobody cared. Why? Because he was a football player. All right. Well, he wasn't. So anyway, so 2000 and, and wait a minute, let me get this straight. 1979, I married this guy. My aunt and uncle were worried. They weren't worried that I was marrying him because he was black. They were worried that, about the kids being biracial. Like how will it be for them to grow up? And I understood the question was reasonable. And I said, I'm not too worried which was just what I, what you say when you're 23 and you're an idiot. You know, <laughs> but anyway, things were good. My parents liked him. This is my mother-in-law, best mother-in-law in the whole world. As a matter of fact, when I, I got divorced 25 years later, I sat on mom's bed and I said, you know, mom, I know where my mistake is. And she said, what was that? I said, I should have married you. <laughs> and she just burst out laughing. <laughs> she, she was a wonderful woman, love her to death. Anyway, my husband also went into the military. Oh, look at him. See, just like Nick Hillary. Came from Jamaica. 
joined the military. And guess what he was too? A soccer coach. He played soccer like you wouldn't believe. And he was a soccer coach. You see why I have some feelings for this whole thing. Now, I also want to point out, let me just show you the next picture here. All right. There, there my husband and I are having our first baby. All right. And this is my mommy with, with, my, with the two first children uh, who are both biracial, as you can see. My mother, who was from New England, where things didn't happen like that in New England, she was worried, mostly about how her friends would take it. But, but her friends took it well. And then my father went up to see my, my grandmother in Maine and took her photos at the wedding. And my grandmother looked up and said, well, things have changed. <laughs> that was all. And after that, they, they, they were perfectly fine. Uh, so here they are. And then this is a, this is a photo of um, uh, myself with my husband and the three children. And in case you're wondering about the child who is black, uh, this is the adoption picture. We adopted my son, Jeremy, when he was... I think was a five now, five or six. I can't remember now, but this is the adoption day. So that that's our family. And, um, and oddly enough, you know, we, 1979, we got married in and we never had any problems. And I still remember the day that my father, we went to Jasper's to have some lunch and the three children were with him and he was holding their little hands and proud as I'll get out walking into the restaurant with his children, his grandchildren. And they loved my grandchildren to the day they died, and my, I raised my kids in the 80s, never had any problems. Raised my kids in the 90s, never had any problems. My kids grew up, mm, oh, let's talk about the white town. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got to talk about the white town. So Potsdam. So, oh, my God, in 2010, they're just so racist. All right. I moved to this. Okay, this is Sportland. This is the house I bought in a place called Burren Heights, uh, Maryland, um, this is a house I lived in. Now, mind you, this was the house was built in 1700s. It was the original house for the entire town. It actually doesn't look like that. It looked like that when I bought it. Um, and it was a gorgeous home uh, built in, I think it was 70, 1770s. Had, uh, let's see how many, fire, six fireplaces. It was run down, but, you know, it was a beautiful home to raise a whole bunch of kids in. And, oh, by the way, my mommy drew that. My mommy, this, my, she was a watercolor artist, and she made that that picture for me, which I love, absolutely love. Anyway, so we moved to this town because I loved the house. The, the real estate agent took me there, and I'm like, and they're all small, smaller houses, and, you know, 1970s houses and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, why, why are you taking me here? And then I returned into the driveway. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in love. And I never looked at the demographics of the town. <laughs> Turned out there were like a 1,000 homes in the town, and 999 of them were homes for white, white white families. There was only one home that had a black woman in it with her two children and her husband had left. So that was it. And then my husband moved in with me. And he I remember him looking out going, did you check this town out before we moved here? And I'm like, not really. And so he was a little worried. And this is 1981. But my husband... We had a great time in the town, had no problem at all. And as a matter of fact, he became the soccer coach in town. Everybody loved him. And then he ran for mayor. They liked him better than I ever liked me. <laughs> so there you go. My kids grew up perfectly happy. They grew up, you know, dating anybody, any race they wanted. There was not any issues. So now we're, now we go to Potsdam in 2010 and supposedly, man, this guy, Everybody hates him because he's dating a he's a dating a white woman. Oh my God! You know, really could oh shock of all shocks. Well, first of all, maybe the more he's a soccer coach. He's a popular dude in town. At least he should be, because again, he's in sports and sports are kind of evener, you know, leveler for you know we care about race. It's like hey, this guy's cool. And she'd already been with a couple other dudes, three other dudes. So I, I, and she was a bartender. I'm not, I'm not thinking that she, it's like the church people came out and with, 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 with pitchforks, you know what I mean? And he was cheating on his, his own girlfriend. So, Hey, you know, maybe this isn't, maybe some issues were about, Hey, they're not the greatest, you know, most moral couple, but who gives a crap, you know? So I honestly think the whole thing about racism is racism in this town is stupid. Just stupid. This is 20 years after I was married. In 1979, when it was not such a big thing. Um, now, let's talk about Jamaica. This is important, too. And people won't understand this. 
if you're going to have racism against somebody in a place which is very white, it's going to be against African Americans, black people from America, not people from Jamaica. Now, unless you're dealing ganja, you know, weed, marijuana, if you're that dude, you know what I mean, then they might have an issue with you. But when you come forth as a well-spoken, polite uh, human being, because you're from another country, you're given some slack because there's no history. It's like, oh, you're from Jamaica. How cool. You're, you're like, oh, that's, it's interesting. What's Jamaica like? You know, oh, isn't that the place with the great beaches? You know, oh, reggae. I love reggae. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. So my husband, I knew, had a better time where I was living because he was Jamaican and not African-American. And that's a fact. So he, people didn't have any issues with him at all. And they got along great. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the way he speaks. If you watch these documentaries, one of the things you're going to notice about Nick Hillary is his very nice way of speaking. And this is very influential. Remember I talked about people making, a, what was that, presumptions? Mm -hmm, presumptions. The presumption is because the man is well-spoken, he could not commit a crime like this. And he speaks very clearly, very, very, very evenly. He comes across very well. That has nothing to do with who he is. That has everything to do with him being a Jamaican. <laughs> because Jamaicans have a certain cadence in their speaking. Um, and the matter they are, the slower they'll speak. So I, I noticed when I was married, that when I got mad at my children, I broke into a Jamaican form of speaking. What do you think you're doing? Why are you doing that? You can't act that way in my home. It is not acceptable. Don't do that. You're going to go to your room now. And I would slow down. I don't know why. I just picked it up. <laughs> now I just shriek and go very fast. <laughs> like my New Jersey roots would have me do. But this is a way of speaking. When a Jamaican tells a story, story, as might, might have been said, and I'm, I say my accent may be crap now because I was married 25 years to a Jamaican and hung around his family. And I've been to Jamaica, but I've also been unmarried for 20 years. So eh, I've lost a lot of it. But I remember my mother-in-law would tell a story. And there was a there's, a there's a methodology to this where you tell the story and you say the same thing three times. But every time you escalate it and make it more interesting, you might say, so the man, him come over to the house. Yes, that's right. Him come right over to the house. And you know what him do? Mm -hmm. Him come up to the door and him knock on the door and him knock and him knock. <laughs> it's a very bad Jamaican accent. I apologize. But it's a story that you tell in, 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 these, in these methodologies. So when Nick Hillary tells a story, he is telling it very, very, he has a very calm way of saying it with a lot of space in between his words. That is a Jamaican thing. And because of that, people say, oh my God, he's very calm. Look at how collected he is. Look at, he must be telling the truth because he's saying these things so politely. That's just the way it's done in a Jamaican way of speaking. So people are making presumptions that this means one thing when it really, quite frankly, is just a cultural thing. It's a, it's a linguistic thing. It's not, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a personality thing. It's a linguistic thing. Um, and so you have to understand it from that point of view. So when I listen to Nick Hillary speaking, I don't say to myself, that makes him innocent to me. I just say, he's telling a story. He is. And that doesn't convince me. So now I'm going to have to go to the evidence, the evidence. <laughs> now, now I'm just messing around. Okay. I'm just going to tell this story before I go to your comments and I'll go to the evidence. I'm just going to tell this joke just because I like this joke and I never get to tell this joke. So this is a Jamaican joke. And so I want you to understand the differences between languages. Uh, Jamaican, a lot of people call it Patois. It's also called Jamaican English. Um, so one of the, there's, a, there's an issue about how things are pronounced in Jamaica. Um, and my, my ex-husband had trouble with this all the time because people couldn't understand him. 
And uh, so this joke goes like this. So the, there's a classroom at the school and there's a fight going on. And the teacher said, what's going on? And Henry says, oh no, this kid says, Henry hit me in the head and it hurts. And the teacher gets very angry because you know, she's, she's a teacher and she says, Henry, she says, how many times have I told you to emphasize your H's, you ignorant idiot? If you're Jamaican, you'll get this joke because Jamaicans put H's before vowels and they eliminate the H's when it's in the world. word. So my husband would say, instead of health food store, he'd say elt food store. And instead of saying heat, he'd say eat. And so it always caused a little bit of a problem. And if you're also Jamaican, I'm going to say this. How, recently, have you watched a flim? And how are the how are the weir weir tires on your car? <laughs> so, I don't know if any Jamaicans are going to show up and appreciate that, or they're all just going to slam me. But anyway, there is a linguistics thing. So when he speaks, he speaks very well. He's very likable, as far as it, he's very convincing. So, but here is the assumption: because he's convincing and he's very has a good cadence to his speech doesn't mean he's innocent. And that's that's the difference. You've got to understand that that doesn't mean you ignore the evidence. Let's look at the evidence. And when I look at the evidence, then we'll see, does the evidence lean toward him or does it lean away from him? Okay, we're gonna look at that. But I wanna check out your comments first before I keep going on, just to give you guys a break from me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> didn't Ted Bundy speak well too? Uh, Yes, but he was a law student, first of all, um, and that helps because obviously he was actually in college at the time. And, uh, of course, uh, also uh, uh, Hillary was uh, also college. He was college grad. So, I mean, it's not like he didn't have education. He did. Um, and also, after you've been, if you, if you work with lawyers long enough, you learn how to speak like lawyers. <laughs> so that also works. Um, oh, you're from uh, Maryland. Uh, Millersville. Hey, Ms. Leah. And I say at Fort Meade, I know it well. I know it well. Usually it's where I turn left, but there you know. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> oh, no, that's terrible. My little sis married a Jamaican and it didn't end well. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, I had 25 years. Um, he was a good father to my children. Um, I still, uh, uh, we could sit in a room and have a wine together and chat and, um, I'm not going to get into my mar you know, marriage history and all that, uh, but I will say he's an honorable citizen and and, and uh, he makes six figures, which I'm not getting paid for. <laughs> but he's doing well. Let's put it that way. He's a great father to the children. So, hey, you know, sometimes you take in life what is good. And uh, what is good was he was a good father. And what is good is I had the best mother-in-law in the world. And I will never, ever be unthankful for that. So, uh, <laughs> Oh my God. Babysitting duties. Sorry, Anne. <laughs> I know those duties. Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. Let me go back up a few minutes. Um, oh, that my father's name was Herbert Williams. He had an oriental friend at MIT who could not pronounce Williams for the rest of his life. They called him Bill. Well, I guess Williams is sort of a Bill. <laughs> oh, that that uh, the nobody bothers me is June Reed. That is correct. He was the first. Uh, uh, he was the first um, Taekwondo. He brought karate to the United States. He built his first, had his first place in uh, Washington D.C., which is where I went when I was seventeen. And I dated his uh, nephew Ho Young Jung, which is also Howard Chung. Um, and we dated for a year. And I was a, I, I achieved green belt there when green belts actually meant green belts and not like white belts. Because uh, I worked for a year for that, I worked five hours a day. And Jun Rhee asked me to be in his movie, and which was going to be filmed in Korea. And then I managed to do something stupid and broke a rib and messed up my leg. And then I didn't get to do it. And some other blonde got to do it, and the movie sucked. So anyway, but I didn't get to go to Korea. So depressing. Oh my God. <laughs> Gretchen says, I feel the same way. My name is Gretchen, but as a child, I was called Gretty. I want to punch people when they call me that. You know, when you're called something you don't like, it's so frustrating. So my name is Pat. Call me Patty. I might have to block you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, they, oh, I looked this up, Strega. The U.S. Army has two-year enlistment options. Now they have them. They didn't then. 
as far as I could look. I looked back and I think it just started a couple of years ago. So no, uh, but I don't know. It's, it, there's, there's reasons people don't, I don't know. That's all I'm saying. I don't know and nobody explored it, but that wasn't true at the point. Uh, but so that's, a, that. but that's not recent. That's not 2011. I don't believe in two. No, no, wait a minute. It wasn't even 2011. Let's face it. He'd been to college and all that. We're talking way back. I don't think they did not have two year enlistments back in like 2000 or whenever the heck he was there. So, um, uh, I think that that's what I'm curious about that because that's kind of doesn't mean anything necessarily, but why doesn't anybody explore is my question. And why don't any of his family come out and talk about him? Why is nobody standing by his side? You no, know, his ex-girlfriend, the one he had three kids with, and maybe a couple more. And I can't figure that out. Uh, where is she? I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Let's go to the evidence. All right. So, because this is more important. All right. So now what happened to this kid? And why was he a suspect? All right. Granted, he was the ex-boyfriend and the kid didn't like him. So he has to be a suspect. And John Jones, again, was seen. Let me let me try to show you this. Um, because people like, he, John Jones creeps me out. I don't like her ex-ex-boyfriend at all. All right. You don't like him, but hey, you know, he, he's like, okay, here is a, here is a map. See that over here, this is John Jones's house. And this is the, ho uh, the high school. And I think there's a, somewhere around here is a, is, is a hospital. John Jones was seen going home on video. Then he was seen walking his dog. The hospital video picked that up. And exactly, you can see, okay, here's, here is some information here. All right, here is, uh, this is John, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, it's, it's not so easy when you're talking about a green screen behind you. Okay, camera at the hospital shows Deputy Jones arriving in his house at 4.52. Go down here. The hospital camera shows Deputy Jones walking a dog at 512. Look over here. All right. The police receive call about noises at Garrett's apartment. This is at 507, and they arrived there at 514. There's no way in God's earth John Jones, if even if you don't like the guy, could have been over here. This is his home. This is Garrett Phillips' apartment. He would have to ditch the dog somehow and race over there. It's just not happening. He was literally walking the dog while Garrett was being killed. So John Jones is just, just not there. He's out of it. All right. So how did Nick Hillary get accused of anything? I mean, just because he's an ex-boyfriend, did he have a solid alibi? All right. Let's check out his solid alibi. This is the first thing that happens. You remember this picture? This is this is this is Garrett skating away. You know, he's is is on a skateboard or a rip, whatever they call that thing. All right, uh, look here. Five four fifty two. The school camera shows the victim on his skateboard near a parking lot at four fifty two. Also, they show him now near the Jones house. Now he's now he's zipping along. He's up here. He's zipping along here. And where is he going? He's going down here. So he's going from here to here. All right. Now, what's the weird thing about this? All right. There is in the parking lot right nearby where that boy is seen. Let me find it here. All right. There is a car in here. You see that car? It's got this little lights on it. It's a rainy, crappy day. Okay. It's near five o'clock. It's October. It's getting dark. It really is getting dark, isn't it? Oh, interesting. I didn't think about that. All right. Anyway, see the see the taillights here? That car is over here. This is Garrett zooming by. That car is here at the same time as Garrett zooming by. Let me show you a little bit better picture of this. Um, all right. There we have Garrett on his little skateboard. There we have, oh, look at that. The car is now following this. Okay, this is where the car was. Then as soon as Garrett goes by on the skateboard, he backs out of the space and takes off in the same direction as Garrett. It's a blue Honda. Okay, it's a blue Honda. Now, one of the frustrating things the police had is they had no clue whose blue Honda this was. Now, mind you, who had a blue Honda? You guessed it, Nick Hillary. But they didn't have a license plate. They couldn't prove it was Nick Hillary. So then 
Nick Hillary does a stupid thing. He actually sues Potsdam for his, the way the police treated him. And I'm going to get to how, what the police found out when they brought him in for questioning. But he got, he got mad, so he actually sued. And during the lawsuit, when he was in court, he had to answer the questions, and he did. And guess what he said? He said, yeah, that was me. Oh, my God. So <laughs> now he confesses to he was in the parking lot. At the time, Garrett rolls by, and then the car pulls out and follows him. Okay, now nah, 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 you're going to be a little more suspicious here, right? All right, so now, now you come down to the questioning. What was he doing in the parking lot? Let me, let me look at my notes here because I think this is interesting. Garrett says, I'm sorry, 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 Garrett's dead. Uh, Nick Hillary says, he went to the school because to recruit soccer players. This is a high school. Uh, Garrett was in the middle school, but this is a high school next door. He can't, went there to recruit soccer players, but he parks. This is what I understand. He, he is going to recruit soccer players. It's a rainy ass day. It's rainy and crappy. He gets there. He parks in a location that's nowhere near the soccer field. We can't see the soccer field. And I've been to a lot of soccer games in my lifetime, including my own granddaughter's game. So I know when you park, a lot of times you can't see the field until you walk all the way over to the field because there's many fields and you got to, you know, it's a lot of work. Claims he didn't get out of the car because it was halftime. Now, how would you know it's halftime? Now, you could guess it's halftime, but you know, sometimes games start late. Sometimes there's a you know, red cards being thrown out and you know, the kid gets injured on the field, so you got to have a timeout and everybody kneels down and all that crap. You have no idea when halftime half is unless you're standing there. But yet, he drives in, parks for just a few seconds, mind you, and determines this halftime. He also says, uh, he waited six minutes and left. Now, I can't quite tell what the video they said, basically he waited for a little bit and then Garrett went by and then he pulled right out and left. Um, and he said he waited there because it was raining and it was halftime and it was raining, so he decided to heck with it. Now, it was already a rainy day. If you're going to go watch the players on a rainy day, what you generally do is wear clothes to go watch players on a rainy day. You cover up. You have some warm stuff on. You have some gloves, which is kind of useful in a crime. And you have something over your head, which is kind of useful in a crime. And you, you're planning to go stand out there in the rain because it's freaking raining. <laughs> That's what you do. You bring an umbrella, you know. But I don't make, it doesn't make any sense. You would go to the game on a rainy day, sit someplace where you can't see the game, Claim it's halftime, have no clothes to wear to go watch the players. And that's why you're there. So none of this makes any sense. Then, all right. Then when he leaves the lot, one of the questions is, which way did he go? So it it's like this. If he turned right, he'd go to his house. If he turned left, that's away from his house. And apparently... I might get this. If I screw this up, excuse me. But he, whatever way he followed Garrett was away from his house. He claimed he was going to go home because his daughter was going to be there. But then when he was pushed, he said, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I changed my mind. And I thought I'd go to the office first. But then I thought I'd change my mind. And I turned around and went the other way. So in other words, he went the wrong way first because he was going to go to his office. Then he changed his mind and went home because his daughter would be there which by the way, is his alibi. He says he went home, his daughter was there and they discussed what they were going to have for dinner. All right. What is he going to have for dinner? He arrives home, he says at 5 p.m. And he and his daughter talked about dinner arrangements, macaroni, tuna casserole. An hour and a half later, this is the, this is the text she sends to him, said, sends to him, what's for dinner? If he was home discussing dinner with him, with her. Why is she asking him on a text what's for dinner? Where is he? What's he doing? What happened to the dinner? So it's really questionable whether he was ever home at that point in time. All right. So now the next thing comes down to this. Let's go back and look at the time frame. So we know that Nick Hillary did leave the parking lot. He was waiting in the parking lot for some game he was going to watch, which he wasn't anywhere near. 
and, 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 and Garrett goes by and then he follows him out, but he claims then he changed directions. Well, okay, uh, let, let's go with, we know he followed him out of the parking lot regardless of what happened after that. Let's go back to the time frame. All right, so now let's see. So, okay, so the school cameras show him uh, Garrett on the skateboard at 4.52. And now he's going out of the 4.52. Mr. Hillary's blue SUV is parked on the north side of the parking lot. At 4.52, he pulls out of the space. So now we're, these two are together. At 4.53, he exits a lot. All right. From 4.53 to 5.21, he's missing in action. Now, he'll claim he went home and hung out with his daughter and discussed dinner plans. And then he claims this, that he arrived, he goes to Mr. Hillary's house. I'm sorry. Hillary goes to Ian Fairley's house, which is here. This, okay. So where, wait a minute. Let's see who's, who's where. Okay. Hillary's up here. It's not, it's like a month. Everything's close. Uh, he's like up here. He claims he left and went to Ian Fair, Fairley's house, which is a buddy he deals with, with a, with a soccer team. He arrives there at supposedly 521. Now, mind you, look over here. At 507, they receive a call about noises at Garrett's apartment. So at 507, they get the phone call. Whether the guy is still there or not is questionable. Whether he already jumped out the window, I don't know. Uh, at 514, they claim they might have heard something. But I don't know that that isn't just Garrett dying. Okay? So by 521... Oh, this is another one. The officer reports the possible sound of move, more movement, 524. Again, this is what the defense used. 524, they thought that he thought he heard some more stuff. So therefore, it couldn't have been Hillary because he was already at Ann Fair, Fair, Fairley's house. All right. Let's talk about Ian Fairley. Ian Fairley is a buddy of his. He says he was on a phone on hold, and he's got some proof that he was on hold at the time at 521. He claims that's when, while he was on hold, that's when Hillary showed up at his house. They had a one-minute conversation. One minute. And he said, uh, well, Hillary wasn't sweating or looking upset or anything, so there was no evidence he committed a crime prior to arriving at his house. So he showed up at my house to tell me. Let's see. What did he tell him? Okay. Um, that he stopped by his, Nick stopped by his house to tell him about a meeting he planned with an injured player, a guy named Jacob Duff, before his scheduled practice at 6 p.m. So he was telling him at five, near five o'clock that, hey, I'm going to have this discussion with this injured player right before the, the, the practice at before 6 p.m. That's why he stops by for a minute. Doesn't he have a phone? I mean, wouldn't you just call up somebody or text him and say, hey, texting is going on. He's texting his daughter. Why does he just text and say, hey, can you come five minutes early for this? Why would he actually drive over from his house to Ian Fairley's house to show up at his door to say, oh, by the way, I want to have a meeting with this guy. Bye. What? So that whole thing doesn't make sense. And, and the problem is he supposedly arrives when this guy's on the phone at 521, but we don't know that that's true. You know, just because he's on the phone at 521 doesn't mean that that's exactly when things happen. It could be 523, 524. So I, and he's also a buddy. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he could push it a wee bit just to help his buddy out. But anyway, listen to this. So anyway, Nick and Fairley meet at the office for the meeting, but Duff doesn't show. Duff said he never got any call about the meeting from Nick. Oh, so he shows up at this guy's house, drives here, stops for a minute to say, hey, before we do the soccer practice, we got to meet with this, this injured guy. But when they get to the soccer practice, there is no injured guy there because he never got notice. Okay, something's wrong with that whole story. So his his daughter claims he was, claims he was home with his daughter but, and discusses dinner, but then she she texts him later and says, "Where? what the heck's happening for dinner? So the question is, was he ever really home or was he coming out of that parking lot and going straight down following Garrett to his house? And then when completing the crime, raced over to Ian Fair, Fair, Fairley's house, which is only a minute away, mind you. So and then walking in for a second and going, oh, by the way, I needed in order to establish an alibi. That's what the police believed. And for a good reason. 
because who else wants to hurt this child? It's, it can't be Jim Jones because he's accounted for and the kid liked him. And B, nobody's, no, now the kid's going to strangle him. So it would have to be a burglar or somebody who really had it out for him. Somebody who had access to the home. And that would be Nick. Now, so anyway, all of this is circumstantial. So the police bring him in to interrogate him. And this is where things get kind of interesting. Oh, sorry. All right. So he's now he's in interrogation. Now, this is where he ends up suing the department because he claims the department uh, unfairly did a whole bunch of stuff to him uh, that they didn't have the right to question him. They didn't have the right to detain him. They also took all his clothes and put him in a you know hazmat suit. And he's got a lot of complaints. But I want you to go to 2020 and watch his actual interview. The guy acts so squirrely, it's understandable why the police are upset with him. They ask him this question. All right. They want him to pull up the right side of his pants so they can look at his foot. All right. Supposedly, they noticed that at that game that night that he walked with a limp. And, and somebody who had jumped off of jumped off of this roof here. I'm, I'm out of the window. Sorry. Anybody who jumped out of this window would have hit maybe this before they hit the ground and then there. So they think this guy might be injured. They thought they saw him limping. Now you'll see a video that looks like he's not limping at that game. So I don't know who's telling the truth there. I do not. But they, in when they were doing the uh, interrogation, they asked him to lift up his right, just let, show, show us your right ankle and we'll be over with. Now, in other words, if nothing's wrong with your foot, we're good. He said, no, he refused to do it. It's very simple. I mean, if you got no injuries, why wouldn't you let somebody look at your foot? He says, no, they said, oh, sorry, wrong one. They said, do you have an injury? He said, no, they made him strip. Guess what? What was that picture I had here before? Mm, let me find it again. Hold on a second. Let me find it. Uh, oh, am I not going to be able to find it? Probably not. Where did it go? Well, in a second. Uh, I had a picture of it. Believe you me, I did. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go search for it now. Because <laughs> it's gone missing on me. Hold on. Where did I put it? I know I took a picture of it. Uh, hold on one second. What in the world? Hold on. Wait a minute. Is that it? Ah, here it is. Hold on a second. Here we go. All right. That is his foot. There is a swollen ankle and a scrape on it. That is an injury that he had. Clearly an injury. After they just determined that he did have a scrape to his foot, possibly from hitting this thing, hitting the ground, swelling of his foot. They said, where did that come from? You know what his claim was? Oh yeah, that's right. I was moving furniture and injured myself while moving furniture. But he'd already said he had no injuries to his foot. And now if they find the injury, he makes up a story. Okay. So what do we have here? We have... Let's go back to Nick. Nick Hillary. Um, we have a guy who's the ex-boyfriend who is often somebody you look at. Uh, the kid doesn't like him. Kid ends up breaking up their relationship and he seemed to really have a thing for her. And, he, and the kid broke up his relationship. He's the last person seen following him out of the school parking lot. His alibis suck. They don't add up. He's very close to each one of those locations and he can make each one of those locations in a few, few, a couple minutes. The guy who jumped out the window had to be able to jump out a window and, and he's a, he's an athlete. So he could do that. Um, he has an injury to his foot and there is DNA. So there, they people claim there is no DNA. Uh, there actually is DNA. Let me, let me explain the DNA issue to you because this is a big mess. Um, Let's see. Uh, 
he, there's a mixture. Okay, let me tell you. Okay, hold on a second. Let me find the easier one. Uh, all right. So the DA defends the tossed DNA. The judge tossed the DNA. Now, my the judge's name, who, by the way, is the same judge that found, this, found Nick Hillary not guilty. His name is Judge Felix Cartan, Catena. He found that former Clarkson's University soccer coach, Oral Nick Hillary, is not guilty of murder. And, that, and now he's a free man. Okay. But there was this issue of the DNA. Now, there was DNA under Garrett's fingernails, which you would expect when somebody's trying to choke you. You, you know, you're trying to fight back. The judge didn't consider any DNA in the rendering of his verdict because he threw out all DNA evidence before the trial. That was because the state lab wasn't trained in collecting samples for the DNA analysis that the prosecutors used. All right. But for the better part of this year, the, uh, the district attorney, uh, Fitzpatrick, had planned on using DNA evidence against Hillary. It had been huge because there was no other physical evidence, which is true. It's all very circumstantial. It became the crux of the defense team's case. All right. Now, what kind of DNA was this? Fitzpatrick has personally asked a New Zealand scientist to run DNA tests using cutting edge technology. There were actually two tests of the DNA under Phillips' fingernails, two. The first test was called random match probability. It came back suggesting there were statistically only eight people in the entire country of 319 million. That matched the DNA profile. Hillary was one of them. The second test was called SDR mix, came back suggesting there might be statistically up to 80 people in the entire country that matched the DNA profile. Hillary being one of them. The judge ruled that the random match probability, number one, exaggerated the possible DNA link. Okay, let's say Hillary was only one. Okay, it wasn't, let's say it wasn't eight people. Let's say it was 8,000 people out of 319 million. How many of those people do you think lived in Potsdam at the time who could have had access to the crime scene? I'm going to say really tiny amount. So if you're one of those 8,000 people, you're probably that guy. But hey, okay, it is exaggerated. All right. Whoops, I just clicked on the wrong. Hold on a second. I just clicked on something didn't want to click on. All right. So then, so one, the random pro match probability exaggerated the possible DNA link, Fitzpatrick said. Oh, no. Then the judge ruled that two, the STR mix couldn't be used on samples taken from the state police crime lab because even though it had been used in other courtrooms, they said that it was, it was a credible form of testing, mind you, but that that crime lab didn't have permission or some, some level of certification to do it. So he dumped all the DNA evidence. So was there DNA evidence? Yes. Two different tests came back, Hillary but those weren't allowed in. Now, I can say that maybe that the New York testing was would have been incompetent. Maybe the other one from New Zealand exaggerated to some extent, and therefore we shouldn't accept it. Let's say we don't accept any of it, the DNA, which they didn't. The simple fact is, as one of the, the DA pointed out, he's a bald-faced liar, and he is. He lied about a lot of things, and he was not cooperative for things that he should have been cooperative for, which made no sense. I mean, hey, pull up your, didn't hurt your ankle, pull up, pull up your clothes. What, what, really, what happened there? Um, because, you know, when we're talking about a guy hanging off a, a, of a, a window and he drops, the, the ankle that's going to be injured is the right one, which was the one that he had injured. Uh, he was following Garrett out of the parking lot, although he claims he would just happen to be going the same direction. His, his alibis are very questionable. He was the only one with motive. So I say to you, I can't say the judge, the judge, he went for, he went against a jury trial once he saw the jury, he went for a judge trial. And I can't, I don't know much about this judge. I don't know if this judge was the type that would, you know, judges have agendas too and personal biases. He may have been under pressure for the, the racism stuff and thought, hey, I, I unless it's absolutely 100%, I can't, you know, 
I'm just not going to find him guilty. Um, should he have been found guilty? I don't know. I'm not there actually to examine every shred of this, uh, uh, of this court case. I don't know if I were sitting in his seat, whether I would have said, look, I think the dude's guilty, but I just don't think the evidence is strong enough. If I throw out the DNA evidence too, I think he did it, but Hey, uh, I don't know where I'd be, but I will say this. I see that the evidence points to no one else. Um, and I do not think at all racism had anything to do with this. Now, in some cases, racism does. And believe you me, all the people are going to jump on me and say, oh, you know, you're just always denying racism. Uh, hey, I'm living with years of dealing with an interracial family. And believe you me, I'm concerned about all of my children, whether they be white, black, or interracial, having a fair shot in life. And if I see any kind of um, racism in certain areas, I'm going to speak up. I am. But I don't see it here. I don't see it here at all. Uh, I see that he was the number one suspect for a damn good reason. And, you know, I, 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 it bothers me that you put out a documentary that pushes racism as the reason for why he was looked at when that's not the reason. You know, it's not. Um, whether he should have been convicted or not is another whole issue. But that he should have been the number one suspect is absolutely true. And the police, I'm not saying their methodologies were great. I'm not going to get all into whether the DA, uh, the prosecutor was cutting corners and doing things she shouldn't have done. I'm not going to get into the whole legal issues because that's not my, that's not my field really. But I'm just going to say, regardless of what anybody did right or wrong, the reason this dude, this guy here, was the number one suspect is because he had the top motive, he had the opportunity, and he lied. That's why. So no matter how you present them in all these other ways, uh, for people who do not understand what goes on in the world and what kind of race, where, where racism is and where it is and, and how Jamaicans uh, are treated as opposed to how African-Americans are treated, all this kind of crap. If you don't know that stuff, you're going to maybe fall for a lot of this, this, these claims that are made. And I'm going to say, having been married to a Jamaican man for 25 years under very similar circumstances, I'm going to say this was not a racial case. All right, I'm going to go to your comments now. All right. <laughs> Let's see what you have to say. <sighs> um, I agree. They looked into him because Garrett didn't like him. It was the reason they broke up. You know, um, and let, let me, let me, I want to say something about that. Hold on a second. About discipline. Jamaicans versus Americans. Jamaicans are more into discipline than Americans. I appreciated that actually with my, my ex. Um, actually, I may have been, I don't know who was worse, him or me, <laughs> but I have no problem with a father or a stepfather expecting that the child be respectful, that he does his schoolwork rather than watch TV. I'm going to say maybe she had a more laissez-faire attitude as, you know, toward the kids. Hey, you can do what you want to do. And he was like, Hey, no, you want your kids to grow up. Okay. They, they got to, they got to act right. They got to they got to focus on school. They can't be just running around doing crap. I personally say I would agree with him on his disciplinary techniques and his viewpoint on parenting. I think he's right. Personally, I think he's right. But they're not his kids. And when you move in as a boyfriend, you got a kid there who, you know, it doesn't go well. I don't even care if you're the greatest guy in the world. It still often doesn't go well. So a lot of times, if you want to get along with that kid, you got to suck up to everything and just let him, let him, have, let his mother do all the discipline and just be the nice guy. It's not a good thing. I, I think personally, you just shouldn't bring, you shouldn't do those mixed mess, messes. <laughs> just don't do it. I don't mean racially. I just mean stepfather, step parenting, boyfriends, girlfriends. I just think you should keep that crap out of your house because your kids do not accept it very well, except in very unique situations where the children maybe have lost their parents very young, a parent very young and doesn't remember them. And then there's a really super great guy who, or great woman who moves, who comes into their lives and they take their time getting to know each other and all works out well. Generally speaking, they hardly knew each other for very long and already they're living together. They shouldn't have been. She made an error in that. And I think she corrected her error when she got out with her kids and said, look, my kids aren't getting along with you. 
I don't say he was wrong in his, his, his thinking as far as how kids should behave and what they should be focused on because Jamaicans are very focused on school and good behavior. And I'm, I'm, I'm with him on that. But the fact is you were hooking up with a lady who maybe wasn't in on that. And so now it's not good. And, and that kid didn't like you because of it, whether he was right or wrong. The, you may have been right, Nick, but the kid didn't like you because of it. And mommy moved out. So you lost your girlfriend over the fact that her kid doesn't like you. I don't know how you responded to that. Just because you seem like a nice guy and all of that, you take care of your other five kids, um, seem good with them, doesn't mean that you didn't lose it with him. And the fact is the evidence points to you, Nick, and nobody else. So there is a problem there. All right. So where, where did you see the girlfriend? The daughter, no, the daughter was interviewed, but not the girlfriend. I wonder what the girlfriend has to say. Mm -hmm. it, it Again, it does now. I don't think it did then. Um, let's see, uh, let's see what else you have to say here. Uh, let's see. Oh my, let's see. Let's see. I'm trying to go down here. For... <laughs> yes, Michaela. <laughs> yes, Michaela. We started a long time ago, <laughs> but you can go back to the beginning and watch from the, that's the great thing about video. Yeah. That's a great thing about video. Um, let's see. Uh, um, oh, I want to point out something about this. Leslie, thank you for saying this because this just brought up something to my head. Uh, seems like a fight, anger that went bad, not a result of killing an unexpected witness or just a random crazy person. Okay, I forgot to mention this. So you got this situation. Then let's go back to the house, all right, uh, the location. And the, people will say this, and, and I think it's really a, a, a silly thing to say. Let's see if I got the right picture. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, here's a, yeah, okay, here's the house, all right? So he jumps out the freaking window. People said, well, it couldn't have been Nick Hillary. Nobody saw a black man jumping out the window. <laughs> Nobody saw anyone jumping out the window. Nobody saw anyone near the house. Nobody saw anyone go in. Nobody saw anyone go up the staircase. Nobody saw anyone around there at all. Was a ghost did it? No. Obviously, somebody did it. But nobody saw the somebody. That's called a thing called luck. Now, what may have happened was, I don't know why Nick Hillary might have, and I'm, I can't say he did because he's been found not guilty. He fought, if he, Let's assume he did follow Garrett home because he was pissed at him. First of all, we don't know what his intention was to kill. His intention may have been to confront. And he goes into the house, knocks on the door, uses his key, or he was already there because he might have had a key and already let himself in. He could have beat Garrett home because he had the car and Garrett had the, the, the skateboard, you know. He could have beat Garrett there, gone up the stairs. And mind you, a lot of times you commit a crime only because you already are aware that nobody saw you. So if he parked his car like somewhere where he knows it's not going to be particularly looked at and then goes over to the apartment, goes up the stairs and he knows nobody saw him, especially if he's covered up and it's cold and crappy day. So I'm going to say he's covered up in spite of the fact that he didn't want to go out and look at the, the, the soccer game because it was raining. OK, so he's covered up and he realizes nobody's seen him. He gets into the house. And he's waiting for Garrett. Garrett comes in, closes the door, puts down his stuff and Nick, uh, and Nick confronts him, says, hey. Why are you messing with me and your mom? And they have a little argument. And maybe Nick is only going to be there to scare him, but Garrett says something that pisses him off or whatever. And he attacks him. Now he's got a problem. He's just killed the kid and he's in the apartment. Somebody hears a scream. The woman comes over and knocks on the door and he goes, oh crap, almighty. And he closed, locks the door. And now he's got to jump out the freaking window. He looks around. Now there's some people supposedly out here working on the car and they say they didn't see anybody. And he couldn't have done it. He couldn't have jumped earlier because they would have seen him. And that was only after they left that he could have jumped. And therefore, it couldn't have been Nick because by that time, the police had heard somebody in the apartment. And the guy, no, I'm sorry. You're working on your car. Half the time, you don't see a damn thing. You're paying attention to what you're doing. So he might have looked out and saw nobody was paying attention. And maybe he didn't have a choice. And he just jumped. And in that moment, he just got lucky. And then he runs for it. And nobody sees him. And he goes, huh, huh that worked out well. Or he could have premeditated this crime. He could have said, I'm going to go there and wait for this kid, knock him off, and then I'm going to get my girlfriend back because that kid won't be in the way anymore. 
we'll just have that little kid who doesn't seem to mind me as much and we'll get back together again because I'll, I'll console her and then, then we'll be all, we'll be good. And he got away with it. I don't know, but nobody saw anybody leave. So there's no reason why it couldn't be Nick. Um, let's see. Yes. He, he, he didn't confess. He followed him. He confessed that he, yes, went out of the parking lot, the same direction that Garrett went out of the parking lot. That, but that was only because at that point he thought he was, how was this going to be? He was, <laughs> I forgot the whole sequence of how he, he was thinking of one thing and then he changed his mind. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was he out scouting unicorns? Maybe. Um, very good, Leslie. Soccer players as young as eight play full games in pouring rain. They sure do. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many games I've had to suffer through with my two sons because I, uh, okay, my daughter says she played soccer too, but I can't remember. <laughs> she, I'm a bad mother. <laughs> I'm going to say the girls' soccer team that she played on wasn't good because I don't remember it. I swear to God, I don't remember her playing soccer. She played softball, but I don't remember the soccer. Uh, okay. So anyway, I remember my two sons because they played well. Okay. Anyway, yes, I remember being stuck in that drenching crap. And now my granddaughter played soccer this season. And holy crap, was it cold and miserable and awful. And yes, did I wear certain clothing? Absolutely. And, and even a an umbrella, which I, I have like seven of them I never use. Now I figured I'd better put one in the car. Yeah, you play in the foot, but pouring rain. It's not like baseball, you know? And he's a soccer player, for God's sake. You didn't tell me, well, I couldn't walk out there because it was raining. Oh, give me a break. Oh, Lord. <laughs> exactly, Leslie. Thank you for saying that. Lies, the man lies. Yes, Lord, he did. And, and, and people will say things like, he was uncomfortable with the police. Um, he didn't trust them, blah, blah, blah. And I, I get it. You have the right to say immediately, I'm not going to say a thing. I'm going to call a lawyer because you feel like they're after you. But he came in saying, I'm willing to help you, blah, blah, blah. But then they asked him a few questions. Like a, they asked him what he, where the soccer game was and other things, and he wouldn't answer them. So they immediately, the red flags went up for them. And they're like, why is this guy acting squirrely? It didn't seem right to them because they're like, you know, he should care that his girlfriend or his, the girlfriend he still wish he was with her son was killed. The kid you lived with for a year. He didn't even ask what happened to him. They said he's dead. And he's like, he didn't say, Oh my God, what happened? He didn't say anything. So the police had reasonable suspicion, re, uh, uh, probable cause to hold him and try to find out if this is the guy that killed him. Um, whether he did or not, they had a reason to think about him. Um, Let's see. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, it's kind of amazing how bad people are at making up plausible lies. Well, you know, here's the thing. You don't expect to be in that situation. Um, if you're a truth teller and, you know, in normal life, you don't do bad things. You don't have any lies to tell. Um, but when you start spinning stuff and, and then you get caught spinning it, you have to think to yourself, how do I get around this? And when they start asking, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you a story, which I'm going to, I'm going to about to call my friend about. <laughs> and this is, this is, I actually had to think this through in my head. Here's a good example. Um, I hope my friend doesn't watch this show. Hmm. Anyway, my friend made me the most gorgeous, gorgeous hand knit cap for my head. I absolutely love it. Love it. It's a beige matches my, oh my God. She's a wonderful crocheter and it's, it's, I just adored it. And it, it, it covered my ears perfectly. And I went to one of those horrible soccer games with my granddaughter, not the, not my granddaughter that she was playing horribly or the soccer game was horrible, but it was cold and crappy. So I put that on. I was so thrilled. She gave this to me and it's disappeared and it's been driving me nuts. I have been tearing my house apart because I have a cabinet in my bedroom and there's a one shelf on the cabinet where I put handmade things. My friend gave me another crocheted hat, which I've had for like 10 years, and it's in there. I have learned to knit, and so I knit a sweater. I mean, I, no, I did not. That's a lie right there. <laughs> I don't have that talent. I knit a scarf. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. That is a lot. I knit a scarf. The scarf is in there. My daughter has um, alpacas and she got some fur from the, the, what do you call it? Hair from the alpacas and had somebody make me a, like a little neck thing. That's in there. And that's where I put handmade things and not the crap I buy from the gas station. You know, <laughs> you know, um, I bought this half in the gas station. I was just like, I needed something in it, and I never paid attention. And then one day my son-in-law says, why do you have that weed hat on? I'm like, holy crap, it does have marijuana leaves. <laughs> I never paid attention. It was just cheap and I was cold. But that's I throw those on the bench inside the door because I don't care. I throw them in the back of my car. I throw them in the trunk because those are things that don't matter. But somebody has made me something. I put it in the cabinet. I cannot find that cap. And it's been driving me insane. I just don't understand how it could disappear. I've looked in every pocket, every every place I can think of. And it's not in the cabinet. It's not any place else. And I'm so upset because I loved it. So now I'm trying to figure out, I want, I, how do I explain this to my friend? So part of me thought, okay, well, maybe I could just say, um, I'd like you to to knit me some nice new things because my friends adored the cap I made. And maybe she could make me another beige one like mine because I want the beige one back. And maybe a black and gray one. I'll pair for all those things. And then the thought came to me. What if she says, could you send me a picture of your beige cap so I know which one I'm making? Now I'm caught, you see? Because although it's not entirely a lie, it's sort of a lie. And so I thought, oh my God. I can't, it, this is my friend. I can't lie. Chris, you know, because first of all, I don't want to, but second, she's going to catch me. <laughs> so I'm just going to call up and say, look, I can't find your cap. And I'm so upset about it. And I'll still pay for the three caps and hopefully I'll find the original one. But, but see how easy it is. You sit there thinking, how am I, I don't want to hurt my friend. I don't want to think I didn't care about the cap. So maybe I'll just say, I want to make some more. And then she's going to ask me for the picture and I'm doomed. <laughs> That's what happens when you lie. Because there's always something that's going to catch your butt. <laughs> so be careful. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Strega says, I, like John Gotti said, I never lie because I don't fear anyone. You only lie when you're afraid. The guy to be shaking in his boots. Interesting point. Yeah, because you know you're going to go down if, you know, so you're desperately trying to handle the situation. Um but, you know, there is a point where I understand that you could be innocent and, and you could be afraid that you'll be. But they said, can we see your foot? He could say, yeah, you can see my foot. But, you know, I was moving furniture and I scraped my foot. I hope you don't think this has anything to do with what happened that night. He could say that and it would have gone better. But he claimed he had no injury whatsoever. And he did. There's a, just a plain out rely. So he just he's, he's screwed them. Um, uh Revenge issues toward the reason of a breakup. Revenge issues are big. Uh, the, the problem is there's no reason to kill this kid. There, no other kid was in the apartment. I mean, if there had been children around, like horse, you know, horse play and stuff, nobody, no, nobody saw anybody. But certainly, kids aren't very good at concealing themselves and doing the right things. So it, there's just no reason to believe a child was involved in this killing. So it either had to be somebody who had access to the apartment or a burglar who somehow got in there or came in behind the kid and killed him for no reason whatsoever. Uh, you know, there's no reason to believe that there's nothing stolen out of the apartment. It wasn't a place to steal anything out of. So why would anybody kill the kid? And the only reason you can come up with is because somebody had some issue with the kid. And the only person at that point in time was Nick Hillary. Uh, the DNA says it all. That's true lore if you believe the DNA is correct. And there are times the DNA is really questionable. And I haven't been able to study this to such an extent where I can say how valid the DNA is. But I'm going to say it looks like it's pretty valid except for the technicalities of it. Um, uh, the judge. The judge is... I think the issue with the whole issue with this is that that particular methodology of DNA may not have been accepted in the, under the court in the courts of in New York and the methodology of which the, the, the particular other New York, uh, uh, the place, the place that tested it was also not quite correct. He may have thrown it out for good logistics. Uh, well, 
good technical reasons or good le legal reasons, but it doesn't mean it wasn't accurate. <laughs> but hey, you know, that's all that matters. If you can get it tossed out, you get it tossed out. It doesn't matter how accurate it is. So uh, Scarlett says, geez, that documentary was really biased. Pat, you opened up my eyes to the truth for sure. It really was a biased documentary. Um, and 2020 is so much better on this one. And 2020 doesn't actually say who did it, but at least they lay out some of the evidence that's there. Um, but uh, who killed Garrett Phillips was highly agenda driven. Uh, and again, anti-racism um, and that's why you have to look into a lot of times when somebody does one documentary, like uh, what, what happened to Aunt Diane? Everybody was white, so there was no racial thing in, in it. So she may have done a great documentary based on the fact that she didn't have that agenda. But maybe over here she had that agenda. She was concerned about black men being accused of things they didn't do just because they were black. But I found it extraordinarily biased because I know I've been I'm like this. I can't I still can't believe this. This all happened like 30 years after I got married and raised a whole bunch of kids to the age of 30. And now now like you can't date a person of another race. Really? Now, I admit in the last number of decade, things have gone downhill again. It was like everything was going uphill and then everything took a turn. Uh, so now I do worry that interracial dating is not as acceptable now because there's so much and everybody's against everybody. And I don't want this to be a political thing. So don't go there with politics or I will knock it off of my uh, comments, but I have seen things change. So I worry because I still have a very interracial family. Um, and I have white, white people in my family, I have black people, I have mixed race people, inter, you know, multiracial people. And I don't want to see it go this way. And during the eighties and nineties, it was actually going really great direction, which is why I was so thrilled because, Oh, there were little things, but there were little things, you know, like I remember when my husband first moved into town, he did complain once because <laughs> apparently right when he moved into town, he was like jogging through the town and some white dude pulled him and said, Hey, get out of town. <laughs> and he was like pretty offended because well, he was the guy clearly thought that he was not a local. And why is like, why is this, this guy running through town? This black guy. Was it wrong? Yes. But let me tell you what happened to me. So I moved to Bowie, Maryland in, I can't remember now, 2000, about eight years ago, nine years ago. Anyway, this used to be a very white town that is, uh, and people used to have tobacco farms. And I mean, it was like, what you call Redna. And then it became the second, I think the top wealthy African-American town in the country where, where African-Americans are moving here, buying huge houses, having, they have great jobs. Kids are well raised. I mean, very, very top African-American town. When I moved here one day, my cat went missing and I, I was going to look, giving out flyers. I went down this, um, this cul-de-sac and these huge houses. And this woman pulled in with her Mercedes and she was a black woman. She got out of her Mercedes. She looked at me and I looked pretty shabby and crappy. I didn't have any makeup on. I just looked like me. And with my, with my flyers. And she's like, excuse me, what are you doing here? And I, and I remember thinking, how funny. She's wondering why this white lady is in her town. And I explained I was looking for my cat and that was all fine. She was, oh, okay. But see, she had the same reaction to me that that guy three decades ago had to my husband because she saw me as not fitting in where I was at. Uh, and no, I don't live in a million dollar house anyway. So, so I see it on both sides. And so I understand how things work and I don't hold things against people. I just laugh when that woman, the woman said that I'm like, I gotta get her point. <laughs> I look pretty crappy and everybody around was black and wealthy and I was white and shabby. Okay. So <laughs> You know, but I explained and that was that. And same thing, my ex-husband, when he got that one comment, he was upset about it. But then he went on to become the soccer coach and run for mayor and everybody loved him and everything was fine. So it's like, you know, you can have an incident or two or three in lifetime, but it doesn't mean the whole world is against you. It doesn't mean everybody's out to get you. And I don't believe Nick Hillary, everybody was out to get Nick Hillary. I believe they probably liked him because he was the soccer coach at the college. They probably really, really liked him. But then this happened and they're like, eh, you know, he was, eh, you know, his ex-boyfriend and he did drive out of the parking lot following the kid.
What are you going to say? Um, did he ever live in that apartment? No, he didn't. But he visited it and he did have the key to it. Yes, he did. And she supposedly when he showed up in, at midnight and over his girlfriend's bed, it freaked her out. So she asked for the key back. However, it doesn't mean that he didn't have a second key. And it doesn't mean that he didn't, just didn't show up there and was standing in the hallway when, when Garrett got home and say, hey, Garrett, I need to talk to you. And the kid's, kid's 12. I mean, it's his, it's his, it's his, it's his mother's boyfriend. He's not going to think the guy's going to kill him. He would say, sure, come on in. Put his stuff down. They start having a conversation and then things go bad. The point is, we don't know. But the point is, it couldn't have happened either. And the problem is, there's not a lot of other choices of what could have happened. Um, Michaela says, my ex wouldn't let me have any say in what was done with the kid. I said it on you how he, well, you know, they say, I just don't want to get into the ex, the situations where, you know, you have mixed families. It always is, is traumatic. <sighs> yeah. She rented it after they split up. She, she, they had a house together, which they shouldn't have had to begin with in my opinion. They should have kept their separate homes, but he left his girlfriend. She left whatever, and they hooked it together. They had a home with her two boys and sometimes his kids visiting. And I think the older girl lived there, and then the other ones visited. And and then after a year, they split up because he wasn't getting along with the boys. So that's that. Um, uh, her ex, yeah, the, the ex-cop um, was definitely involved in her life to some extent. He was there on the first, in, when they told her that her son was dead, he was there holding her hand. And that's why people say, hey, you know, he has something to do with it. He's on video walking the dog. He did not kill Garrett Phillips. <laughs> he just couldn't do it. He's on video. <laughs> you can you can hate him all you want. He didn't kill the kid. Um, uh, very true, Andini. His five kids probably listened to him and followed his rules. Of course, because and he, I'm not saying he didn't do good by his own five kids. And I wish he'd stayed with his own five kids. And I don't know what and marry their dang mother or whatever. Um, but you know, he could have been a good father to those children, but it doesn't mean he didn't have issues with this other child who was, I would say, he, you know, he had a thing for, uh, you know, Garrett's mom and he wanted to be with her and this kid was in his way. Um, I don't know what kind of guy Rick, Rick, uh, Rick was. I, I, Rick Hillary, I don't know what kind of guy he was. But I'm going to say, you don't either. And neither does anybody watching these things. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's a super great guy or he's a very control freak. That he has. Oh, some people did say he had anger problems. He could snap like that. He could change like that. Some people did say that. I just don't know. Don't know. But I'm looking at the evidence and I'm saying, I'm having problems with it. You know, that, that I can't come up with anybody else. And Nick lied. So there's that. Um <laughs> really? Oh, okay, Laura. <laughs> and you ended up leaning the way I'm leaning. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, you said, you know, you didn't know which way I was going to go with this. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, I guess you were leaning that way. Most people lean the other way because they've seen the HBO documentary, not the 2020. And it's very convincing in the sense that he's presented, Nick is presented as really, I mean, it's hard to dislike him. And that's why I'm trying to tell you the cadence of his voice makes people believe in him because he has such a nice way of talking. And I would not do this to a child. I would not. I don't know why everybody, he's got his nice way. He's not talking trash. He's not talking and he's got this nice way of talking, but that is just the Jamaican way of talking. So I'm saying people don't understand. It's just a linguistics thing and a cultural thing, not so much a personality thing. And people confuse those things. Um, uh, have there ever been any other suspects? No. Why? Because John Jones was on camera walking the dang dog. Kids couldn't have done it. So who the heck else did it? There was a, such a tiny time frame. The kid comes home. We have, we have Nick Hillary here. The kid goes in the house and within a couple minutes, a few minutes, he's dead. Who else was it? I mean, we don't have any other suspects. There aren't any. Now, could it be possible that there was a burglar in there or some of the guy that hated Nick, I mean, uh, Garrett that we don't know about. He's only, he's only a 12 year old kid. Some other person's in there who strangles him and kills him. And then poor Nick 
Nick Hillary just happens to be in the area making up stores. Sure. Maybe that's what got him off, <laughs> but it's not likely. Um, what? <laughs> not that I know of. Now, that would be really bad if my, my beautiful cap ended up someplace it shouldn't. You know, because, you know, here's an interesting thing. I could have maybe dropped it. Somehow fell out of my pocket on the way out of the soccer game. Somebody picked it up and then they used it in the commission of a crime. And then my DNA would be on the cap. Wouldn't it now? Because touch DNA, which is mostly garbage these days and is being used to claim people are involved in something they're not involved in. My touch DNA would be on that cap and then it could transfer. And then I would be guilty of committing a crime. Ah, that could happen. That could happen. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what else you have to say? Um, Oh, why do some people, Gretchen says, like dislike the police officer who was the ex-boyfriend? If I had to choose between the ex-boyfriend and Nick as somebody I want to hang out with, I might choose Nick. Okay, I'm a little biased. I, you know, I, was, a, I was attracted to Jamaican men. I'd go with Nick. I mean, I would. I think he's handsome. I understand the culture. I'd go with Nick. Uh, Jones, um, I found him kind of, uh, I agree with some people. He seems kind of creepy to me. He seems a little uh, aggressive, uh, controlling, a bunch of other stuff. Didn't appeal to me. But so what? He's He's got a rock solid alibi and Nick doesn't. And Nick is the one that has the squirrely things that run around him along with a bad alibi. So, you know, this is where you can't allow you just um, your personal attraction to a, a suspect. And I don't mean that sexually. I just mean that you think this person seems nice and this person doesn't seem nice. But, you know, for me, when I looked at this case, initially, I'm attracted to Nick Hiller because I said I've been around the Jamaican community for a few decades um, I'm uncomfortable with it. And it's, it's a weird thing. Um, the other day, uh, my, my daughter said, Hey, you know, uh, one of our relatives is coming into town from Jamaica and one of them coming down from Canada and we're going to get together at this hotel and hang out. And mind you, I've been divorced for over 20 years. These are my ex-husband's relatives. I've never met them, but I went. And do you know what happened? I got in that room with those people and I felt like I was home. We laughed, we joked, we ate food. So comfortable, made me so happy. And I'm thinking, they even know I'm the ex-wife and they still like me. I had such a good time. And they're like, come on, come on down to Jamaica. You know, you got to come down. You could do this work. You could do that work. You could come and stay with me. And I'm like, these are my people. I'm attracted to that because I've been around that culture for so long. I'm attracted to Nick Hillary. I'm attracted to the way he speaks. I'm attracted to his general lifestyle, his culture, all that stuff. I think he's, personally, I think he's guilty <laughs> because I don't let that feeling get in my way of looking at the evidence. And this is where I think a lot of people allow their emotions and their agendas. And, oh, I don't want to, for example, if you're a white person, oh, I don't want to be racist. It can't be this guy. That's like, hey, you know, all people of all colors commit crimes. It's the way it is. There's no, there's no innocent parties out there as far as race goes or religion or status, you know? So you got to go with the evidence. And this is what profiling is all about. Now, I can't say that a Nick Hillary committed this crime. I realize that I, I feel like he's guilty, but I, 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 you know, he has been found not guilty by a court of law. And that's that. It can't be retried because we have, you know, double jeopardy in this country. It never happened. I think this crime will remain unsolved forever. Uh, but as a profiler and showing your crime scene analysis, I'm going to say there was a reason the police honed in on, on Nick Hillary and believed he did it. And that's why even today their prosecution says 
we believe he did it and why there's probably going to be an action on this case looking for the other guy. I don't think the kid was in the bed. I think he was on the floor, personally. I think he was on the floor. Um, uh, thank you, Laura. I've been waiting for you to cover this case. Thank you so much for granting my wish. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't always, but, you know, I, I have so many requests that it sort of just comes down to kind of what hits me at that time or when I'm investigating different cases. I'm looking at them, trying to decide which one I want to do. And some of them I just there's not enough there to work with. And other ones, I'm like, eh, wait a minute, there's something there. Uh, this case was like that. I was like, I started out thinking there was going to be nothing, but then I became very interested in it as I started looking into it further, especially when I got to the 2020 documentary, which I thank God they did that one. Um, uh, this case is frustrating, says Stephanie. There's really only one suspect, but not enough evidence. Such a tiny time frame and geographic location. The time frame is tiny, but it is not impossible for him to have committed the crime because you have to look at the two alibis he has and say they're both garbage. Geographically, he could easily hit all those spots. Um, would he, if you were on a jury, would you convict him? That's a whole nother, another question. When they threw out the DNA, they left, they left the, no, if it was, if it was a jury, it was, it was a judge, but if it were a jury, they would have left the jury with literally just uh the motive and the lies, which are pretty good, uh, and the time frame. And I think a lot of people have been tripped up with the time frame. I believe so, even though I think the time frame is not unreasonable that he couldn't commit the crime at all. Um, but I think I think a defense attorney would trip up a jury in a heartbeat. So I think no matter which way Hillary went, I think he actually took a chance on the judge. I'm not quite sure why he did that, but I think he would have gotten off of the jury. Um, Bradford Bishop. It's very, it sounds familiar to me. So I, I know it's, uh, I'm not sure. It sounds familiar though. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Pat wants to date a murderer. Well, I am single at the moment and he's not considered guilty. Wait a minute. I think he's really too young for me. No, I don't think he's going to go for me. I think, I think I'm too old for him. So I think that, I think that one's uh, out the window. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um did he leave fingerprints no this was one of the issues um but it was a rainy cold day personally i'd be wearing gloves but i don't know no and then, you know this is this is an apartment uh they said there were some fingerprints on the window that weren't his but then there's lots of people in the apartment there's kids over who knows? I mean, that's where the tough part gets. It gets very confusing. Um, but I, if I were him, I might have been wearing, uh, wearing wearing gloves on a cold, crappy, rainy day. Might have been very possible. Um, let's say. Uh, uh, I have. I, I, I will look at Bradford Bishop. Oh, I'm going to put that in here right now, just so I don't forget. I don't know why that sounds so familiar to me. Hopefully it wasn't a relative. <laughs> it's like, who, who is Bradford Bishop? I No, now my internet's not working. Really? But uh, it does sound familiar to me, so I'm going to check over here on my iPad. Hold on a sec. Bradford Bishop. I just know the name, and I don't know why I knew the name. Bradford Bishop. Uh, let's see. Oh, that guy. Okay. Mm. Bludgeoning to death his wife. Okay. That was, wait, 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 when, when was this though? Uh, let's see. He bludgeoned to death his, oh, his mother, his wife, his mother, and his three sons in Bethesda, Maryland. Okay. He's, he's in Montgomery County. You don't seem to understand this, but I'm in Prince George's County, also known as PG County. We don't give a crap what happens in Montgomery County. <laughs> We're the poor sister of Montgomery County. So since you are so, oh, that's a sign language saying for snobby. Yeah, we don't care about you. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. Uh, then what happened? 1976. Okay. He was, he trans allegedly transported the bodies to Columbia, North Carolina, buried the bodies in a shallow grave and lit them on fire. Yeah. He was charged locally with murder. And then federally, unlawful flight. I'm going to say God did it. I mean, I don't. I, this is one of those cases I wouldn't waste my time with. 
Uh, it's, it's a family annihilation. He killed them all. That's that. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. Um, family annihilations. So I don't know that there's much to go with. Did he disappear? Oh, he's still armed and extremely dangerous. Oh, he managed to flee. Uh -huh. Well, that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, he's on Wikipedia. So he got, he got let's see, I just want to see the end of this thing. Possible, oh, possible sightings. Oh, he had money, man. He had, he, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, though. I might want to date this guy, too. Okay. <laughs> he's fond of dogs, also enjoys scotch whiskey, peanuts, and spicy foods. Oh, my heart. Spicy foods. Mm hmm. And then he's got a maybe a diplomatic passport and be running around Sweden. And I may have to look at this a little more just because he's got a really interesting run around the world uh, free type of thing. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> um, oh, really? I lived a block from the house where that happened. <laughs> the thing I wonder about is his disappearance. Yes. That would be true. How did he get away with this? That's fascinating. Former United States Foreign Service officer. Fugitive from justice. Okay, I'll look a little more into that. But hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, Stephanie, am I right about Montgomery County and PG County? <laughs> Y'all don't like us over here, PG. I know. You think we're trash. Mm hmm You do. <laughs> One of the things I tell people... You, you got to have a sense of humor in life. You know, if you can't have a sense of humor, you'll drive yourself crazy. You know what I mean? So it's like people are like, oh, how could you say that? You know, you got to have a little fun. You do because life is tough. There are a lot of sad things in life. You got to have some fun. Mm. So I <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> it's a long, it's a, it's a long story for this area. Just, just let you know, Prince George's County, when we had the, I forgot when it was, but there was a new person that came in uh, after Jack Johnson, our, our um, uh, he, he got caught in a big, huge, uh, he was crooked as hell and he got caught. And so then we had the new person come in and they were trying to like clean up this place. So they're like, don't say it's PG County. I mean, Montgomery County it says Montgomery County and, you know, out in uh, you know, Fairfax County in Virginia and PG. We just say PG. No, no, no. Don't say PG. Just say Prince George's. So all these, these signs went up. Welcome to Prince George's County. And what was the sign thing that went with it? Welcome to Prince George's County, a livable community. <laughs> and we we're like, a livable community? And somebody wrote on before the livable. Anyway. We were all like, you know, hey, come on, just, just, we're PG, you know, we're PG and we've been PG forever. So, <sighs> yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> but touche. <laughs> oh my God, that's just funny. <laughs> oh my God, what is it? You know, I've been sneezing a lot lately and I, people keep asking if I'm allergic to something and I'm getting to think I'm allergic to something because like I'll sneeze like, like six times a day, like 10 sneezes at a time. And I still have no clue what I could be allergic to because my eyes don't run. My nose isn't stuffy. Nothing's wrong except I sneeze a lot. My nose is just, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Whoa, wait, 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 man, Kelly. Pat needs a man. <laughs> no, oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> Maybe Jose Bias is available after Casey Anthony went south. Really? You really? You think I'd go that low? <laughs> Look, am I going to go for a criminal? <laughs> At least it'll just be like some you know, local fun criminal. You know, the guy I meet at the gas station with the gold chains that keeps saying, hey, babe. You know, that guy. <laughs> Jose Bias, never, never would I, never. <laughs> I have some, I have some blind there you know oh my god okay <laughs> enough of this <clears throat> anyway thank you all for being here uh it was it was fun and um again if you're new to the channel please do like and subscribe join patreon if you'd like to be in the chat room harassing me or telling me i should date Jose <laughs> i'm so sad now oh my god oh my god <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Michaela says, I thought you typed Joan Bias at first. 
Joan Baez will be a lot better than Jose Baez. Come on now. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Allison, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Pat. Very interesting tonight. Remember to click on the like. Please do. Trying to keep the channel surviving, uh, which I am. But, you know, now that uh, uh, the people have been caught for, you know, uh, Delphi and uh, Idaho, my, my subscription rate is dropping like a <laughs> because people who came for that are going away. But, hey, I'm satisfied with where I'm at right now. At least I know I have great people um, and I'm um, I'm going along and I'm still getting to do all the, the, the analyzing of the cases that I like to do. So that is cool. So, uh, <laughs> and Haley says, thank you. Joan is a much better choice. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you have a great weekend as well, Scarlett. Uh, <laughs> thank you from Montgomery County. I did have a house I was looking at in Montgomery County. And I, I, instead, I found this great house in, in Prince George's. Prince George's. And uh, all my kids turned into rednecks. And yeah, which is quite amazing. <laughs> they still blame me. No. <laughs> Again, have a sense of humor about life because life will do it to you no matter what. <laughs> my, my ghost cat. What ghost cat? I do have a ghost cat now. Uh, I have no cat. Yeah. My, my Ziggy is gone. And so when I open the door now, I don't have anything to greet me, but I do have spiders in my bathroom, which I kind of like. They're called cellar spiders, and I'm watching them. And my, my cleaning lady thinks I'm insane because I keep telling her, uh, no toques las arañas. Um, and don't touch the spiders because I like to watch them. And so I think I am maybe insane, but hey, they're free pets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. All right. So anyway, I will see you somewhere during the week for the uh, Hangout. And um, and I'm going to go see now when I listen to the show, whether I have a, well, I have music uh, audio with the, uh, the int intro. And if I don't, my son is going to fix this yet again. It's really annoying. But I, what can I do? Because it's not my fault for once. It's not my fault. Anyway, see you next time. Mm -hmm.